Hi everyone, I'm Mike and this is the Sunday Art Show. This week I'm going to show you how to create a landscape painting using watercolour and water brushes. So I'm starting out with A2 mixed media paper and I use this paper because um, it's really good for a, you know, a range of media as, as, the, as the name implies but the main thing is when you're using it with watercolour it doesn't buckle too badly. It will buckle a bit but once it dries out you can usually flatten that out by rolling the paper. And the view I'm painting today is uh, it's actually kind of almost like a hidden valley really fairly near to where we live. So when lockdown started um, a few months ago obviously uh, social distancing was implemented in, in the UK like in many countries in the world uh, and we were allowed to take a, a walk once a day you know, to get some exercise and we were really lucky in Exeter although Exeter is a city if, if you're not from the UK you know if you may be watching this from the States um, cities in the UK vary dramatically in size so so generally speaking the rule here is if you have a cathedral in your kind of settlement then that that's considered a city so for example the smallest city in this country might only have you know a few tens of thousands of people whereas London of course greater London has several million so we have a wide range and, and Exeter is a small city I think our population is about 140,000 people um, but what that means is it's, it's very compact and even though you can kind of live a, uh, something of a city life then you can walk to the countryside fairly easily and quickly you know you, you get into these re fairly remote areas pretty quickly um, so that was kind of a long-winded introduction to uh, to the situation but this hidden valley what caught my eye were these long reeds growing near the bed of a stream and the way they were catching the light just really really beautiful and what I've been doing while I've been chatting away there is with my water brush I've mixed up this fairly dark neutral color with uh, from paint watercolor paint left on my palette so this is just a mix of stuff left on my palette and I've just worked up something reasonably dark and neutral and what I'm doing is just putting in the dark tones in the foreground that's what I've done so far and you can see I've picked out little patches of, of tone on the left hand side where the reeds are catching the light and now having done that I'm coming back in and popping in the silhouettes of some of the some of the trees in, in the middle distance So we're dealing with a relatively complex scene here. There's, you know, there's quite a lot going on. There are hedges, fields, trees, reeds. You've got the sky to deal with. Uh, long grass, short grass. You know, rolling hills. Quite a lot going on. So the way I approach that is to just look at it as a pattern of light and dark. And I simply look and say, well, what are the biggest darkest aspects of this scene. So for example, the tree is a fairly clear silhouette, you know, against the light sky. I can just depict that shape as I'm doing now. But in the foreground it's a little more complicated, there's a lot going on. But there is kind of like a deep dark line running diagonally across that bottom right hand corner. So I put that in near the start, A because it's a, you know, it's a big dark shape as I mentioned, but also it kind of helps as a perspective line to start to create a sense of depth in the composition. But back to these trees that I'm working on at the moment. Now, what happens with the water brush is, so you've got a reservoir of water within the plastic handle, and then obviously you, you put paint on the, on the bristles from the palette as normal, so when you start to paint, you're going to get quite a you know a relatively dark mark uh, and then as the paint runs out on the bristles rather than just refresh the bristles which of course you know we're, all, we're free to do um, we can just squeeze the handle release more water and then you're going to get a more fluid lighter version of the paint you were putting down and for that reason it's a really nice efficient way to draw and block in areas because you're automatically getting some nice variation in the in the intensity of the paint you put down. You get some nice drying marks if you dilute it appropriately. 
and you can look how rapidly I can move around the paper and just draw the scene in without having to go back to my palette too frequently. So I'm always looking for ways to be more efficient with my with my painting and for that reason I really enjoy using the water brush. But having kind of blocked in the composition with my neutral tone I've now just switched to pure ultramarine blue and you can see I'm putting that on fairly rapidly across the, the sky in sweeping diagonal strokes for the most part and I'm not too worried about um, getting the sky exactly right but in general I want it to be a little bit darker and more intense high up compared to near the horizon. But also notice I'm keeping it darker on the right hand side compared to the left and that will often be the case if you look at the sky it isn't always one tone as you pan round from left to right um, but even if it is one tone it can be an interesting variation to include within your painting as well. And now with a paper towel I'm just lifting off some of that wet paint to suggest the presence of some clouds. And, and doing it this way it creates, creates a nice random edge. To, you know, if, if you try to draw a cloud, I don't know about you, but if I try and draw a cloud, after a few seconds I start to just kind of replicate the same fluffy curvy line and, and that's not really very realistic. So using something like a scrunched up paper towel is a nice way to introduce an element of randomness to, to our work. So I'm just putting in a little bit of wet in wet, a bluish, uh, fairly neutral green to, to suggest some of those distant he uh, hedges on, on the hills there. And while I've been chatting, I've also started to colour in some of the fields. And as I'm working from the far distance to the foreground in the painting, then I'm gradually making those colours stronger and warmer. Now, when I come to paint grass or hedgerows or bushes uh, in the foreground, then one of the ways to start doing that is to just add some as random as possible sweeping brush strokes crisscrossing over each other you know in a variety of colors so uh, that's more or less what I'm doing at the moment really it's you know I've got had that yellowish color on my brush I've now added something a little more greeny uh, and I'm just overlaying that and now I'm coming in with a dark purple for some of the darker shadow regions as well or not, not it's not so much a dark purple but a strong purple So as always, I list the materials I use for each of these demos in the description below the video. But uh, just to sort of let you know what I'm using in terms of paints, I'm using the Winsor & Newton Professional Watercolours. Uh, they come in little tubes or, or you know, fairly small tubes. Um, and then uh, I'm just using the synthetic uh, water brushes. I'm using a flat at the moment, which is roughly a uh, quarter of an inch wide. Um, and then maybe near a three-eighths of an inch wide uh, and then I'm going to use a round brush as well today. Now when you're dealing with something like these reeds, uh, partly this is part of the reason I was drawn to this painting is you know how, how are we going to tackle it? So as mentioned earlier I started with those fairly neutral rectangles to represent the, the dark patches of shadow that the heads of the reeds um, have. And then I kind of put a halo of shadow around that, that area to, to bring the light of the paper out. And then I've just added some near pure ultramarine blue as well, just to add a little dimension to those, that shadow there. So, you know, I'm not going for like a photographic representation of this scene, but I just want to sort of capture a sense of place. And I'm hoping a little bit of the magic of, of the light. But one of the things I'm noticing already in my work is that my colour scheme is somewhat cooler than it is in reality. So 
although it was still fairly early in the year, it was a beautiful sunny day and there was kind of more warmth to the light and the scene than I'm depicting. But I kind of like what I'm doing at the moment, so I'm going to stick with this particular colour scheme. So that's something I always find interesting is the, the transfer for, from looking at our reference, our, our inspiration, and how that changes as it kind of passes through our brains and through our arms and our fingers and our brushes onto the page. So, you know, you often get something a little bit different to, to perhaps what you first envisage painting. But sometimes that can be, you know, a real treat. Other times it just other times we just call it a mistake, but uh, but in this case I'm fairly happy so far. Yeah, so oh, you know oh, it's kind of obvious, but the other th really good thing about the paper towel is the ability to lift off paint, especially when you're using watercolor in different ways. You can let the wet paint soak into the paper towel, like I did for the clouds in the sky. Or you can sweep paint off the off the paper, and so the paper towel becomes a painting tool in in itself, because you can use a thin folded edge, kind of a sharp edge of the of the paper towel. Uh, you can use the flat of the towel. You can fold it and scrunch it as I did earlier, uh, and of course you can even paint the paper towel itself with your brush, and then put that down onto the paper. So something, you know, very simple. I think this is one of the great you know the great things with art. You don't need necessarily expensive materials and equipment to get something effective or interesting to look at. So having let those initial washes and brush marks dry, I'm now coming in with a rather darker, thicker watercolour mix. So a deep green here. And I still hadn't mentioned my palette, have I? I talked about the paints, but I didn't go onto the palette. So yes, I'm using Alizarin Crimson, French ultramarine blue, cadmium yellow, and burnt umber. Uh, and, and that's it, basically. A uh, good tip, though, is that if you are painting plant life and things like that, it is sometimes worth including magenta in your, um, in your palette because there are colours in nature which you know you, you may well struggle to, to mix up with the paint with the colours I mentioned. Another good one for the for sort of a really bright blue is either a cobalt blue or a thalassinine blue. Uh, those are both particularly vibrant and um, or silurian blue as well actually. So you know I, I'm using a fairly restricted palette, but um, you know I, I will definitely use other colours if I feel the need to. You know it's. Uh, I don't have a hard and fast rule about the colours I use. And in fact, once in a while, I'll kind of change up the palette I use just to kind of bring a fresh look to my work and force myself not to get too bogged down into the, the same working practices. So again, I'm not trying to copy each blade of grass here. I'm just trying to mimic the general movement of the grass and the way it's falling. Um, there's actually a little, you can't see it at all, but that line of dark shadow that I mentioned earlier, the one that's going di diagonally from the bottom of the painting to the right-hand edge of the painting, you know, the, the area I'm working on now, the reason it's so dark there is there is a tiny little stream trickling along under the, underneath all of that uh, long grass. Uh, you know, and it's pretty much invisible from this angle, but it is definitely there. Um, and in fact, this you know this valley is so it's so cool because, um, as I said, it's right on the edge of the city. You know, very close to a, suburb, a suburban area. But if you go just beyond the, this little stream and climb up the steep neighbouring hill, then you can look back on the whole of the city of Exeter and you can see the distant church spires and the cathedral and you can even see, I'll try and show you, I'm not sure if it will show up very well on screen, but you can even see uh, the English Channel which is uh, a few miles away and the mouth of the River X. Um, so it's a really spectacular panoramic view up high on the hills near this area but as you can see down within the valley there are lots of beautiful views as well so within just a short walk you can get a real variety 
of, of different scenes. So if you wanted to, you could almost spend, you know, um, I don't know about a lifetime, but you could spend a long time uh, looking at different views and being inspired by them for sure. Now I'm coming back to the trees here and when I go to paint some of these smaller branches for the most part what I'm doing is using the very tips of the bristles and the water brush will sometimes kind of form just through repeated use a slight curve and so I just kind of make use of that curve the curve and the natural curve in the flat brush to put down little arcs of paint simply formed by where the tips of the bristles contact the paper. So it's not me drawing a little arc, I'm simply just placing the very end of the brush on the paper. And it's a useful way to just automatically create little windswept twigs and branches in the higher parts of the tree. But again, I need to be careful not to repeat that same pattern, that same motif over and over again, because unless you want a particularly stylized illustrative look to your trees then it won't look particularly realistic if you repeat exactly the same thing over and over. And then I've just moved across to the second tree now and I'm trying to make that one in keeping with the first but different again you know so so notice that the marks I've used on or I'm using on the second one are you know they're, they're a little bit different a little bit more streamlined and a little bit straighter oh yes I almost forgot to tell you actually so uh, talking earlier about the different colors and how sometimes it's a good thing to introduce a, a different color to or an unusual color to your palette uh, the other color I am using and it's the very first time I've ever used this color in any painting actually is permanent rose and so I actually use that to create some of the purpley color in the foreground there um, so yes yeah, so that's a that's a really good thing uh, I find to just introduce something completely brand new to your palette and see what effect it has and see how that changes the colors you mix up but back to the trees for this third tree on the left the the, the paints kind of running out of my brush and I'm very happy with that because it's giving this third tree a slightly different more wispy transparent look and I'm carrying that on to the hedge, hedges to the left of that tree that tree as well. Excuse my hip, hiccup there. So one of the main things I'm trying to keep in mind is you know a sense of depth so I'm trying to make sure I keep uh, an air of wispiness and translucency and coolness for the distant stuff and then stronger, bolder, darker, more dramatic lighting in the foreground. Now, when I go back to the very distant hedges, you know, this really is you know, a, a dangerous, dangerous place because the lure of detail, you know, when we look at our reference, our brain and our eyes kind of naturally hone in on the detail, even if it's a long way off. But to maintain that illusion of depth, then you've got to minimize that detail when you paint something that's very distant. So when I painted that little strip of hedges to the to the left of the center tree, I put down little marks with the brush and I suddenly realized that's probably not the best approach and that's why I kind of smudged and smoothed things out with my finger. Now on the right hand side, I just put in a kind of a splotch of uh, greenish paint and lifted it off with the paper towel. And I'll come back to that at the end of the painting because I want to talk about that in a bit. That's kind of meant to simulate a hedge, but we'll, we'll come back to that as I said. Back to the, fore a little bit more of the foreground though, to the left, and I'm using the round water brush now to put in some kind of wispier lines of a slightly different quality than you typically get from the flat brush. So I'm not a great one for using a huge variety of brushes. I find I work more efficiently if I just, you know, it's rare for me to use half a dozen brushes within a painting. 
Oh, you know, I will if I need to, but often I just use two or three. But I find that doing that it keeps things efficient for me in terms of my colour mixing, but also it forces me or encourages me to really become familiar with the variety of marks I can make with a particular brush. So I kind of feel maybe maybe that seems a little bit backwards to some people. Maybe I should just take the attitude, you know, this brush does this, this brush does this well and make make things easy. But I kind of like, I don't know, there's something about just using a single brush in as wide a variety of ways as possible. It's, there's something about it I enjoy. Now the bright light which is coming through from behind these reeds is, is quite a challenge if you're going to take the, the pure watercolour approach. So, um, you know, we could use some white acrylic or some opaque ac acrylic of a different colour to just paint those areas. But for this particular painting, I want to create that sense of light purely from leaving the, the paper uncoated. So that's why I'm not trying to steer away from getting too fiddly with those reed heads. But we'll come back to those in a bit. What I'm, what I'm doing at the moment is just coming into the, that dark shadow region or, or regions down in the bottom of the painting in the foreground and I'm putting on some cadmium yellow which is more or less straight from the tube. I might have mixed a bit of alizarin crimson in there but the point is that the paint is barely diluted at all and so we can get watercolour to be fairly opaque over the top of our dried initial washes if we use it in this way. And again, what I'm doing here is I'm trying to be selective about how many of these, you know, blades or tufts of grass I put in. And I'm trying to take care to not replicate the same angle of brush stroke over and over again. So back in with a dark bluey shadow colour now. Now with watercolour, the more fluid it is, then in some ways the more expressive it is, but obviously you have less control. Conversely, if you take it straight out of the tube, it acts more like a traditional paint and what you put down tends to be what you get. But you can, of course, dilute it once it's on the paper. Um, and there is, a, there is kind of a happy middle ground where you sort of get the combination of happy accidents, but also that little bit of control. And I th for me, that's one of the continuing challenges of watercolour, is to just be willing to let the paint do its own thing, but at the same time, you know, maintain just that little bit of control that we need so that we, you know, we get the effect that we want. But I personally, I'm really enjoying the way the purple I mixed up with that permanent rose, uh, which is in that middle ground. I, I like the way that's working against the dark blue shadows. And on the left, I'm just suggesting, just with some very, you know, hopefully fairly graceful, smooth lines, some of the stalks of the, and the stems of those long reeds. So if you look at the painting uh, to the right of the right hand tree, you can just about see on camera that, you know, it is buckling and it's buckling in a couple of places, other places as well. But as mentioned, you know, when this is fully dry, um, I, I haven't had a problem with this paper at all. And with acrylic paint, it's even more forgiving. So it's, it's really good stuff. I use it for pretty much all my work these days if I don't use the Claire Fontaine paper. And I do sometimes use Bristol board for drawings as well. So I'm continuing that bluish shadow onto the trees. But again, I'm taking care 
not to put down too hard an edge with any of the shadow regions I've put down. So I can soften those with the paper towel as I'm doing now, or I could dilute them with water. And I haven't done it much for this painting, but you know, a, a spray bottle of water is also really useful for watercolour uh, and acrylic, in fact, to create spontaneous textures or just to move paint around a bit once you've put it down. Now I'm rolling the flat brush here across the paper for this left hand tree and again lifting some off with the paper towel just to create uh, a hint of foliage in a fairly random way on that left hand tree. But those marks I've put down they are perhaps a little dark compared to the lovely light wispiness that I had for that for that left hand tree and that's why I'm, I'm just scrubbing off uh, most of what I did there. So there's the finished painting and I don't know about you but I, I really like the effect. It's not certainly not photographic, it's very loose and impressionist but I love the effect and the kind of light and sense of place I've got. Now the right hand splodgy green bit, you know what is going on there, it's not really anything but I kind of like it and I can't explain why to you, I just, I just like it, I feel it works well and in particular this painting I feel really comes to life when you put it on to um, you know, a, a tapestry or a home decor product. I think it works well as a gridded pattern. Um, anyway, so there's the finished painting. So hope you enjoyed this little demo of watercolour painting of a hidden valley with long reeds. Uh, I really enjoy painting it and I'm going to try and do a different version of a similar scene in the near future. So thanks very much for watching. Please remember to like, comment and subscribe. And I hope to see you next Sunday for the next episode of The Sunday Art Show.